Well, hello, friends, uh, friends of Dick Termis. Uh, I am here. My name is Bonnie Fleming. I'm here at the Termosphere Gallery. It's a beautiful May day. Uh, got the sun shining on the gallery here. What we're going to do first, while well, we get people a chance to kind of log on and queue up, I'm going to give you a little tour of this place in case you haven't seen it because it is remarkable. It's one of the coolest places I know of and I love to come down here and hang out. So just to give you a little feel of the environment here, here's the gallery. It's one of four geodesic domes um, here. This is the one that, the gal that all of his artwork hangs in. Uh, if you look up here though, check out this beautiful valley that it's in. It is just, you got to come here and check it out yourself. It's just gorgeous. Got the sun shining today. Um, just lovely. So what I'm going to do, so I'm going to get in here, I'm going to walk around, show you some stuff while we wait for Dick to get ready and get settled down. So here we go, up the stairs. Got some fun wind chimes. So when you come visit, you just kind of walk up this way. We'll let you know the hours here in a little bit. Um, right now, uh, there's me. Hi, guys. Here we go. Check out this majesty in here. Look at this. We do have the lights off because the motors are a little loud, so bear with us being a little dark in here. But look at this place. Look at how cool this is. Right now he's got a ton of spheres in here. He just took a show down, so he's got a lot to look at. Um, I believe this one's a fairly new piece here. But look at this. If you haven't been, you just really have to come here. you got to see it for your own self. You know, and plus the cool thing is if you're lucky, you get to talk to Dick himself. Um, he'll tell you more about these. But what the plan is today here is he's going to come in in a minute. He's going to sit down right over here. I'm going to sit with him. And uh, I've got some prepared questions. We're going to just kind of do an interview. But you guys are more than welcome to submit any questions you have. I know it's a little unconventional form of art here and so if you have any thing you're dying to know you know about Dick his work uh, the domes you know where the heck we are how to get here you know you chime in you let us know uh, have somebody moderate in those comments handed them to me and I will uh... hey good one Jill Jill asked what they're made of that is actually on my list so we'll get to that um, it's one of the first questions we're gonna answer so stay tuned great question uh, looking around here, this piece is awesome. This is uh, the globe, Shakespeare's globe. And he did this one, he uh, incorporated all the cool scenes from Shakespeare's plays in there. It's a beautiful piece. One of my favorites, they're all my favorites. What am I talking about? Anyway, we'll just keep wandering around until Dick gets here. You know, just trying to, like I said, trying to get people time to tune in. Um, these are a cool little thing that he got. We started doing these panoramas of his spheres. So you can actually buy these. This is the whole sphere, but it's flat. So you can actually buy these pieces and uh, hang them up on your wall, which is kind of a fun concept for, for a thermosphere. That's something you got to hang from the ceiling. All right, so Dick is here. I believe he's entered. Um, Here's Dylan getting ready. Hi, Dylan. Hi. All right, here's Dick here. I'm going to have Dylan hold the camera. It would not let me turn it sideways, so we're doing it that way. So it won't clip in there. Um, Hello, Bonnie. Dick, how you doing? I am good. How are you? Good, good. Dylan's getting good. situated here. <laughs> I think we'll just go ahead and get started. Go yep, um, right ahead. We already had one question, great question, but it is in our questions already, so you're oh. prepared to answer it. All right. So, starting out, I am here with world-renowned artist Dick Termis, who is known for his spherical paintings called Termosphere. First question, what's a Termosphere? I'm Termis, that's a sphere. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, but we could get more in-depth with that answer. We could say... Uh, uh, Termosphere it a lot of times has pers six point perspective in it. A lot of times, it, it, and sometimes it's realistic worlds uh, like in, insides of uh, cathedrals and stuff like that where I capture everything north, south, east, west, up and down. 
Um, so the realism is part of it. Surreal, I love surreal. I'm just starting a new surreal piece right now. And it's, but it, a lot of times it plays with the same perspective because it, it makes you aware that you're inside of a world and seeing it all the way around you. So talk to me a little bit more about that. When I look at a painting on the wall, I'm seeing a beautiful landscape or whatever. I'm seeing everything that would be in front of me, correct? Yeah, right. And so what you're saying is that by painting on a sphere, you're getting kind of more than that. Tell a complete me. environment, okay. yeah. You're getting the whole scene. A lot of times you walk away from being in a cathedral or in a great environment and you take a couple pictures of them and you get home and you go, that just doesn't do it, you know? I just, I, it doesn't give me the feeling that I just experienced. I think that if you can capture a spherical view of that, a lot of times you get a lot closer to that experience. Right. So it's an, I'm an environmental painter, I think. Excellent, that, that's a great way to put it. Um, so is that kind of what made you want to paint on spheres, is that you could include that I could capture a bigger picture. Everything. You know, the pan, you know, the panoramics for years have been around way back. I mean, the early old cameras would do panoramics 360 degrees, but they didn't get up above you and all of that neat stuff. Right, you get like a long, thin photo that went really, right. really wide. Yes, yes, yes. So you're saving space by painting on a sphere. Saving space? Yes, wall space. Oh, <laughs> well, that's one advantage is that I can always, if people can't find a place to hang one of my pieces, I can come in and find it a good spot in a hurry for them. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, and how long have you been uh, painting on spheres? How long have you been painting thermospheres? This is the 50th year. 50th? 50th well, 50th, congratulations. Yep, yep, it has been uh, 1968. Okay. 68, 69 school year at the University of Wyoming is when I hit on the idea. And, and it took me, you know, I would work on spheres for a couple years, but it wasn't like full time all the time. It wasn't like uh, one of those total aha moments, but pretty soon I realized what these spheres were doing and what my flat work were doing was such a different kind of thing that the sphere direction seemed a lot more interesting to me. So I, I do see some um, flat paintings behind you. Are those all, you know, all that they're they're about fifty years old then? Yes, indeed. Yeah. Has it been that long since you've painted a, yes, a flat? Yes. Piece? That's that's interesting. Well, they might go into seventy two. Okay. You know, when I was at Otis Art Institute, I, I painted some flat, but mainly I was painting on the sphere. Right. And so the it was sort of dwindling down about then. And after like seventy, I guess seventy one is when I graduated from Otis. And from that point on, I haven't really touched a flat painting. Maybe I've touched up a few of them, sure. but I haven't really. Well, and I noticed in, in the one directly behind you, you're still playing with geometry. I mean, there's still circles. I mean, it seems like you've always been kind of fascinated with the geometry of, of you know, and pushing that a little bit. And very, seeing... very much, yes. In fact, when I look back at a lot of my flat paintings, a lot of the same kinds of stuff, I just find how do you put that into a whole world? Right around you instead of just a one little view of it. I'm going off script here, I apologize. Okay. Um, do you find, like, like, playing with the geometry, is it easier on a flat canvas, or does it, I imagine it's it's tricky to get the geometry sometimes to work going around a, a sphere. Um, well, it's a different kind of geometry. Okay. So, beans, I was working with flat geometries, and I knew the kinds of uh, different systems that would fit on the flat, when I got to the sphere and I realized that geometry is not gonna fit on that ball. That it, it, that's when I started studying all the platonic solids okay. and all the different geometries that are three-dimensional. And that, and so it, it was the same, you know, I use it the same way. It's just like a different package. Right, you had to figure out a, a different code essentially for that. Right. Was it um, restrictive or liberating to move to the sphere from the flat campus? Uh, well, I don't know. I, I, I know it was very, very different. Yeah. You know, and, and it, it, what was cool about it, too, is that I couldn't find anybody else that had done it to help me do it. <laughs> so I, it sort of, you know, it's like the old philosophy. If you, you're looking for a book and you can't find it, you have to write you have the to book. You write the book. You know, <laughs> and this is kind of where I was with the sphere. So, so since you pioneered, the, has, have people come to you? 
asking for your knowledge, you know, since you're the, the, res the only resource? <laughs> well, kind of. I mean, yeah, a lot of people. There, there still isn't, like, a lot of people out there painting on spheres or anything like that. Uh, I do a lot of workshops where I do explore, you know, I do let take people all the way to six, six point perspective. Uh, and a lot of them are really very good yeah, at it, yeah, you know, yeah. but well, I haven't seen any follow through. I, you know, the, the thing about the arts, everybody wants to be their own thing. Mm -hmm. So if you start painting on spheres, it's like I always get branded with MC Escher. Right, right. And you know, after a while, it gets a little bit tired. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure that they don't want to be branded as a little termos right, guy, right, you know, right, exactly. either. So, it's, it's a blessing and a curse. Yeah. I so, it, I mean, you, and I really push the idea that they uh, find their own direction, too. I mean, that's, but I, I will give them everything. I, I, I'm, a lot of my knowledge comes from all the artists in the past. Sure. I studied yep. a lot of those yep. guys. Well, I was pointing out your, uh, Shakespeare piece, I think, you know, we take inspiration from everywhere, you know, and he's obviously not a painter, but you were inspired to do yes. a piece based on his art. Yes, yes. So we have gotten asked a couple times, um, what what are they painting, what's a thermosphere made out of? It's, uh, most of them are polyethylene plastic, they'd be light fixtures, like a, a, a light bulb inside of them okay. from your ceiling, and then the transparent ones are acrylic. Okay. So in order to get it so you can really see through it and see the back side and the front side, you know, then uh, you need acrylic okay. to do that. Because the one, the the traditional ones are a, they're a, a white, right? They're a kind of a translucent white color. Right. And then yes. and then you put a primer coat on them before you start painting. Yes. Yes. Right. In fact, rough them all up so the paint will stick. Okay. Fix the seam, custom body fill the seam, sand it back. My, my sons help me out with that quite a bit. They, I think I've heard them complain, <laughs> yes, about, complain it about it. Time, about that, time. Yes. I've got to go but they're getting spheres. really good at it. So. Well, you know, they're the best in the yeah, business. That's right, that's right. Um, so let's say you have a concept for what you want to, uh, you know, we, I, I'm an artist too, and so you'll like have a sketchbook or whatever, and you kind of draw some, some things out. Um, I noticed the pieces behind you are those kind of your version of a sketchbook. Right. Um, yeah. So you'll kind of work out a concept on a small piece, and then if you decide it's sphere worthy, you'll you'll graduate it up. That's true. But I mean, usually do start with a sketch on the flat first, okay. and work out some problems that way. So I know what the con make sure I have a concept mm -hmm. of some kind. Sure. And then before I take it to a big sphere, which takes me three or four months sometimes to do, I want to do it. I want to know it's going to work. Because you never know if it's going to work on a sphere until you put it on right, a sphere, right. how it's going to all fit together and flow okay. together. So I'll, I'll start with the smaller uh, sketches like that, and I pr progress to different sizes, probably try three or four different ideas. Okay. I finish them off, so I have something in the gallery to sell yeah. that's a little cheaper, too. So we we uh, that that's kind of my process. They are my sketch pads, you're right. All right. Well, and I think that's so fascinating to see, because I... I do recognize some concepts on the little ones behind you that I've seen, you know, yep. graduate almost to the to the big pieces. Right. We got right. a question from uh, Jill Goodrich here, who is wondering, um, artists out there, who inspires you the most? Where do you draw your, um, who do you admire the most? As well, a, you know, now it's it is Escher, of course. Yeah. But when I was when I hit on the idea, it's uh, the idea itself. You know, I, I, there was a variety of people. I mean, I enjoyed Picasso. I, I think the guts of taking on a whole new adventure by yourself, right. with the cubism with him, and Calder the, with the mobiles, mm -hmm. and, and Paul Clay, the way he had such structural sense in his head and how childlike his right. paintings come out. I mean, all of those guys really, it, a lot of the modern artists that, that broke new ground. That's, I think, were the guys that inspired me the most. Right. Yeah, well, obviously, you kind of went your own direction. So it, it's, you can see that, you know, I think as, as artists, we try to push the bounty. You're always trying to better or do something different or new. And uh, Very much, yes. You, you did definitely do that. <laughs> well, I try and do that, yes. How many thermospheres would you say you've painted in your 50-year career? Well, my, part of my problem with an answer for that are all of these little <laughs> ones. I don't know what, at what stage do you start counting. Mm -hmm. But major pieces, 12 inches, 16, and 24, and 
seven and a half feet, five and a half feet, some of those that I've done. You know, uh, um, some of those actually eat up like six months and nine months of the year. So you don't get a heck of a lot more done right, in that right. one year. But probably three, four hundred, I suspect, okay. that and are major pieces. You, I mean, you mentioned some big pieces. What's the biggest thermosphere you've painted? Yeah, that's seven, seven and a half foot that I did for the Law Enforcement Academy in Wyoming, Douglas, Wyoming. Okay, and that's that famous photo I've seen of it's like hanging from a helicopter. Right. It's yeah, I built it so big that I couldn't get it into the <laughs> courtyard. And I didn't realize that till you know, all of a sudden I went, how am I going to get this in there, you know? And I was thinking of cranes or something. Well, there weren't any cranes around. So the next thought was, well, a helicopter will have to lift it up and bring it over. And the guy was great. But boy, was that a surprise to realize <laughs> I have to invest in a helicopter lift. Yeah, you always have to think installation, <laughs> huh? Yes, sir. A lot of money was lost on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite sphere that you've painted? You know, a lot of people ask me that, and I, I usually answer by I need about seven of them to be my favorite ones because of all the different directions that I take my mind. Right. With the realism, the geometry, the surreal, the, um, it, it, and a million other. And, and some are uh, commission pieces, so they lead, lead me in other, like the Belfouche right. piece. Right. I was led to go study the history of Belfouche, which is really fun. I, Lewis and Clark, I mean, there's a lot of different directions that I like to play, but probably the Pantheon okay. is one of my favorite ones. It was a 12-inch one. I used to haul it with me all over Europe. Because it was like my Mona Lisa, I, <laughs> I, you know, like you want to take something that impresses people, right. so you take the one that you like, and and it isn't so big and bulky right, like right. some of the pieces. So talk about that one for a minute, because you went to the Pantheon in it's in Rome. Yeah, and and so tell me a little bit about the process of how you went from just being there to creating a, a sphere, and then you know why does that make it your favorite piece? Well, the Pantheon is, to start with, is a ball, in a way. Okay. Because the architect took a ball and put it on a table, and then he built a cylindrical wall around it tight, and that's the basis of the Pantheon. Okay. So when you stand in the very center of that cylinder, you're actually standing on the surface, conceptually, on the surface of the sphere. And that's the magic right, of the right. Pantheon. Most people don't know that, but <laughs> when you stand in the middle, there's a design sense that makes you go, ooh, this so, is perfect. This is a perfect spot to stand. So it was just begging to be a thermosphere. It, it was already a sphere, <laughs> so I just let it be. And I made it, you know, usually I'll shift off to the sides of, so it gets a little uh, uh, not so just, symmetrical. Just for, because um, I think some people might not understand the the. From being from standing in the room to painting it on the, the sphere, what is your process? Because um, you have to kind of capture the room around you yes. while, while you're standing there, because you can't just go home and remember how it was. I remember one of the first ones I actually did a realistic world on the sphere, because for quite a few years I didn't take on the realistic world because I was trained as a modern artist, <laughs> <laughs> and you don't do realism right. if you're a modern artist. But finally I realized that, you know, some of the best stuff I could show off with this system of perspective is real buildings, interiors of real buildings. I could capture all of that. So it took, took me quite a while to do it. I went to our rotunda in Pier, and that was one of the first ones where I actually took on the interior of the rotunda on the outside of the sphere. And I remember as I was doing it, I finally stopped and I had to go sit down and go, I don't know how to do this. <laughs> Realism is supposed to be so easy. Why is it I don't know what I'm doing here? But all of a sudden, I realized that the ball, in a, when you're looking at a scene outside of it and you're trying to copy that on the sphere, that the, you have to move the sphere ahead if you want to get to the next scene. Then you have to walk a little further and then move the ball. The ball has to keep moving with you right, and right, ahead of you right. a little bit. And it took me a long time to... I Somehow I thought, well, you just copy what you see here back there and what you see on this side of the ball from over there. It doesn't right, work, right, work because quite that it, way. It distorts around the edges, like well, what, what lenses and that's That's really fast. I think a lot of people 
simplify that in their heads like you did. And, yeah, and it's yeah. not until you're in there that you realize. Until you actually try and do it. And, and you know, I geometry is part of the six-point perspective and the realistic worlds, mm -hmm. too. And one of the things I learned is I had to put six equal distant points on the sphere. And I remember thinking, why is that so important? Why can't you shift the points around, have them closer together over here and further apart? And I tried to do that, and I realized that that isn't how distortion happens. Distortion, the, the points always stay the same. The building can move. You can move within the building. You can be really close to a wall, which makes it really big mm -hmm. over here, really far away over here. If you're right in the center, all of them are equal. Right. You know, and so it, it, it took me a little bit of time to figure all of that stuff out. And I'm still, I mean, it still is a learning process right. for me. I learn every day stuff. Well, so in, in moving those points, wouldn't you say it's because it, it has to be kind of a north, south, east, west, up and down? I mean, that's that's a truth. That's not a, a concept. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, I was just told we're running low on time, so okay. we can move right along <laughs> okay, here. Okay, good, good. Um, you got a piece next to you. Do you want to talk to us about that a little bit? I would. Um, the... <laughs> I've, in uh, recent years, I've gotten into painting some, some of the time. I'm not like totally focusing on this kind of stuff, but with transparent bowls. The reason it's fun is because, and challenging, really challenging, is that the, the, what I paint, what this is, is cubes. Uh, every other one is left open, but it, it builds walls, six walls to make a cubical room when you look at it from the inside. So okay. the inside of it is like a, a cubicle room with lots of openings. And, uh, and then, but it's just pure cubes when you, when you look at it. Uh, and, but then when you look at it on the outside, it can transform into a whole different world. Of, the cubes all have plants growing out of them and birds sitting on the plants. And the challenge is to not have the, the branches showing on the inside at all. So it, what you want to do is just kind of blow people away. Right, right. Bit, right. So you actually painted that piece twice, is what you're telling me. Very much. In okay. fact, maybe even three or four times. <laughs> because what you have to do, uh, the inside is all painted. I want to make sure it's in the right place there. The, um, what you do is you, you draw the cubicle stuff, and then you paint what you want on the inside first. Then you have to paint over it with a lot of white paint. So it doesn't show through. So it doesn't show through. And the, but every time you do that, you have to be precise and not run the white over the outside of the, the stuff you've drawn already sure. or it throws it off. And then after about five or six coats of white, then you get to paint what's on the outside. Wow. In order to do it. And then the, whenever you put plants, if you notice really close here, the plants have to run wherever the cubes overlap each other enough to where you don't see them on the inside. So that I have to design the plants to fit to, to, with the opaque so areas. So you don't see the plants at all on the inside. And then I'm noticing, and correct me if I'm wrong here, that the shape of the cubes on the inside isn't necessarily the shape of the cube you painted on the outside. Well, they're sort of a reversal, I suppose. Well, right. and these have holes in them. Okay. Yep. You know, not all the way through, yep. but it's re recessed right. little cubicle So they holes. look like they're almost hollow, and then the ones on yep. the inside look... Are solid, yeah. And so you it, really, it's, yeah. It's just trickery. Right. So this is your newest piece you just finished. <laughs> yeah, I just finished this, and I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm really quite excited. I'm off... Because this is such a tight... Your head has to be so tight, <laughs> I like to go very organic. Right, right. right. Yeah, so the would, next one's going to be very surreal. Yeah, I got a sneak peek on those sketches, guys, and we'll cover yeah. that probably in the next live video, so you'll have to cool, tune cool. into that. We're going to do more of these, so you know we're having way too much fun. Um, okay. We've got but, one more question that was asked. Okay, we've got so another question here. Hold on. Um, you can do something all right, so we want to talk uh, just for a minute um, about where we are. What is this place that we uh, are? This is the Thermosphere Gallery. Okay. And it's out, out, out of Spearfish a little bit, a couple, three miles out of Spearfish. Spearfish, South Dakota. Spearfish, South Dakota, yeah. You could get people, <laughs> who knows yep. where they're from. And uh, you, get, you get outside of Spearfish on Christensen Drive, 
and you drive uh, about two miles from the main road, uh, Highway 14 out here that runs next to the interstate. Drive back in here and you'll see like five domes, geodesic domes. One of the biggest dome is actually the gallery. And that's yeah. where we're sitting right now. That's where we're at right now. And it's full of, um, oh, and it's full of maybe 70, 80 spheres, major spheres in here that rotate. So it's, when people, I love to watch people walk in the door because they kind of take one step in and then they just staggerly go back a couple <laughs> steps and go, oh my God. Well, I, I think everybody kind of has a perception when they're, you know, headed here or whatever. And it just kind of, it blows me away every time I walk. I just can't believe that I'm here and it, it just tickles you. And, and then, you know, and that's before you start to take in the amount of work and the, the awe-inspiring pieces that are in here. Um, we got a question. Do you prefer surrealism? over realism or a mix of the two? You said that you, you're excited to kind of let your brain go. Do you need that balance? Do you have a... a I think I do. I must need to go back and mm -hmm. forth and back and forth. That's one of the advantages of the sphere is that I can do a lot of different kinds of styles and, and they're always still my stuff. People recognize it as Dick Dermott. Well, oh, you, you definitely have a... I mean, even from the, the in famous interiors to, you know, but... There is a way that you paint that is so whimsical and, uh, you know, it's unmistakable, we'll put it that way. Well, I love making up creatures mm -hmm. and stuff. I mean, that is one of my favorite things. And I probably enjoy doing those the most, but I think the capturing like Notre Dame Cathedral or the Pantheon and stuff, there's really quite an award to that, right. too. Right. Well, they're masterpieces in themselves, and yes. so you have to do them justice yes. by painting them. Yep. In, in and the to game. be able to capture that whole thing that those architects figured out, right. you know, to capture it all in one, in one uh, painting mm -hmm. is, you know, it's really quite neat. Yep, yep. Um, okay, so back to visiting the gallery. Um, so we covered you can get here. It's in Spearfish. Um, do you have hours? Do, can people just come whenever they want, or do you prefer they come at a certain time? Well, we're, we're going to have actually the, the main, where well, we're here all the time on May 24th. Okay. But now it's uh, weekends from 9 to 5. Okay. And But anytime you want to come, if you call us, just call our the Termosphere Gallery uh, number, 642-4805. Okay. Uh, yeah, then you will open the door that's, no matter uh, what. Six zero five six four two four eight zero five. That's right. Don't and they'll forget. they'll let you in. Um, for people from Paris. Yep. <laughs> so on that note, um, if they can't make it here, um, is there a way to like dive in and get some uh, insights yeah, into it? Check it yeah, out. Yeah, you know I I've got a lot of YouTubes. I think about eighty some YouTubes. Okay. You just put in Dick Termas, um, uh, Termospheres. And it pop, uh, it'll pop up. Right. I think Dick Termas is, I found, is the best. Yeah. YouTube.com slash Dick Termas. <laughs> YouTube first, yes. You need the YouTube so, first. And, and what you kind of do there is you'll put up a sphere and let it film and kind of talk about it. So and sometimes it's walking through. Right. And so one, one of my actually started way outside and said, pretended like, what is this place? <laughs> <laughs> so Which I'm sure you say every time you come But along. the website is really excellent too. Right. As you know, because you put it together. <laughs> <laughs> so then that has like, in one section, it has all the thermospheres that I've ever painted mm -hmm. that are major right. on it. So yeah, I mean, we've, we've kind of used it as an archive of your work and, and, you know, more than just information we're trying to. Right. Kind of yeah. have a biography. Is there any other like really cool projects you're working on right now? Well, I just finished one for Belfouche, and it's over in the Tri-State Museum in Belfouche. Okay. Really a cool museum, yeah. and this piece is the history of Belfouche. Awesome. With Seth Bullock kind of the, the, being the main person that discovered See, it. See, I tied Seth Bullock to Deadwood. I didn't know he had a lot of history up in Belfouche, so... He started it. I, I learned something guy. today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, he was Belfouche, and his partner was from... Bel was from uh, he was the mayor okay. of, uh, of, Belf or of uh, Deadwood. Deadwood, yep, yep. And, uh, you know, it's, and they're all in my piece that I did for the city of Deadwood. Mm -hmm. So it's a big one up there in the visitor center, too. There's so. some great history here, that's for sure. Yep. Um, Tom asks again, what's the largest sphere you painted? We covered that a little yep, earlier, yep. the seven-foot piece. Seven and a half foot. Yeah. Um, is there a second biggest one? 
All right. Uh, two of them, the five and a half foot ones, one's in Rapid okay. at the convention center yep. Yep. in the theater section yep. of it. And uh, that's of the history or kind of the story of South Dakota sure. during our centennial year. I traveled with cameras and took pictures and tied it. It's called the Endless Horizon. Okay. It's an endless horizon of, of South Dakota. And uh, then another one I did for North Pole, Alaska, Ooh. that's up in the <laughs> North Pole High School, hangs up there. And it's kind of the history of, um, of that area. Too. So you get to travel a lot to go paint. A lot of traveling, yeah, that's, yes. That's yes. awesome. It's, it's nice to be able to go to Paris, mm -hmm. and, and I've done like probably five or six spheres from it. It's way over. One of my favorite, um, you know, we talked earlier about the influence of M.C. Escher, but you actually went to where he grew up, where M.C. Escher grew up, and you, you kind of did a sphere of his neighborhood and then incorporated the little characters and the impossible illusions and, right. and all of that. I think, I mean, that's... Kind of showed where his ideas came from. Right. I just made it up, yeah. but it's like, <laughs> it's in Rovillo, Italy, okay. is where, where he spent a lot of time. He didn't really grow up there. He okay. was a Dutch artist, but... He spent a lot of time in Ravillo, and, and so I ended up with two spheres from that world oh, that, that yeah. was, were his favorite. And I was there because I got to uh, show my work with M.C. Escher at the University of Rome. Oh, wow. They selected me and three other artists to be with Escher. Oh, wow. So it was a yeah, big, yeah. kind of a big deal for me. So not only have you, you know, kind of attached to Escher, they've, they've realized that you're... Uh, a really cool guy too and get to <laughs> hang out with him that's kind of neat well I, his son george escher has been here twice oh has he yeah that's so cool. that's the, that's that was, super cool yep that yeah. was very good yeah very good um do we have another question uh, none right now okay. lots of people talking just about how much they love visiting how much they love your work um we have uh Tish Armstrong said, loved visiting the gallery last summer with my family. Uh, thanks for sharing your artistry with us. Pate Penelope Call New uh, says, we loved it too. Um, <laughs> Danielle Flom um, said, I love your work. Back, uh, thank you for the paper crafts a few months back. Um, Jill Goodrich asks, uh, says, uh, Love your work. You have been a giant inspiration to my own artwork. Awesome. That's just yeah. such a lovely thing. Um, uh, Tom Harmon, the same fellow who just asked about the largest, um, asked if you've ever had a sphere installed by helicopter. That was that <laughs> that large one. Right. Yeah. 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 In Douglas, Wyoming. Yeah. Um, Tom, if you look back in the video a little ways, uh, Dick did talk about having a, a very large piece installed by helicopter out of necessity because <laughs> there was no other way to do it <laughs> right. um, also uh, just because it's here um, Susan O'Connell says happy birthday to Marky oh happy birthday Marky <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, Dick's wife happy birthday Marky for Mark me too yes yes, yes. It's a big happy birthday you're gonna keep painting forever and ever and ever till I can I guess. <laughs> yeah and oh. Um, oh we we did forget to talk about the uh, you and I are working on a project together right now that's pretty neat. Well, that's um, right. Yes. Why don't you go ahead? And well, this is the we're producing a book on murals, and I, years ago, starting in the '70s, I started. I did about 18 flat murals, and then I did what I think of as three-dimensional murals. After that, about seven or eight of them across South Dakota. Across just South Dakota, and it was. Uh, I was with the State Arts Council artists in the schools and and I go spend a semester out in schools and live there and work on this with kids and with town people and whatever mm -hmm. so anyway we had all of these I and I really cook, kept good images of them and we're putting that all together and mm -hmm. kind of the philosophy behind each mural and so that's been a big project that we've been working on right and it's been I mean the neatest thing of well Kind of a tragic thing is that not a lot of these murals are still right, right. still there. They've been painted over, the buildings have been destroyed or whatever. But there's a couple of funny little stories about finding them behind walls and that sort of thing. But I think, you know, just hearing from people that worked on them, where you had a piece that you had to go back and, and touch up, and some of the kids that helped to begin with. Um, yeah, it's really fun when a kid is working away and says, 
oh, my father did this one. He, and I'm touching that. Yep, yep. So that we're, we're, we're getting that finished up. Um, I have really enjoyed working on that project, cool. and I'm excited to get it out. Done a great in, job, too. It's world. really going to be fun. Well, you know, um, I think we're, we're kind of asking if anybody did work on those murals, if you want to reach out and tell us your experience. Ooh, that with, would be good. Yeah, any of that sort of stuff. Um, we'll let be, we'll let be me putting, reinforce that. The idea that if any of you help to work on any of these, we would like some input back from you as to what that experience was like. Right, right, yeah. You know, and maybe some of, the, if it's really interesting stuff, we'll put it in the book. <laughs> <laughs> you we're looking, there's a couple pieces we don't have the best image. So if you have any images you'd like to share, yeah. any of that stuff, we're uh, putting it together right now. So uh, we'll take any input we can get on that. So. Yep. Yep. Well, I think that about wraps it up for us. That's yep. all our questions. Um, anything else you want to say? I think... For now, we'll right, cover yeah. this, and hours then we'll do it again. Gallery. Okay, the yeah. hours for the gallery. We, we did say they're open. Nine, uh, nine to five every, well, uh, once May 24th hits, mm -hmm. we'll be open nine to five every day. Every day. And right now, we're open on weekends, nine to five. Okay. And, uh, but call any other time. If we know, we'll we'll leave the coffee shop and come here and open the door. <laughs> Stop playing some tennis and get yeah, down that's here. Right, playing a little tennis and stuff. <laughs> Going for beautiful bike rides. So summer hours start at the end of May, and that goes through the summer. And, yep. Uh, mm -hmm. We're gonna do some events and stuff too. So stay posted. Um, just really excited to get some people down here. Well, this was a great we'll, chat. We'll be doing this again. Yep. We'll be doing more um, interviews with you. So stay tuned cool. for those and cool. uh, get your questions ready. And uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Thank you for watching.